evolutionary armor, the human brain is still a fragile organ. Our skull provides the first line of defense against physical injury. On the inside, sheets of membrane covering the brain keep out invading germs and toxins. But even these safety barriers can't stave off all injury. They're no match against head-on collision or the missile force of a bullet. In fact, traumatic brain injury is the number one killer of people under 34. There's a saying used by doctors, touch the brain, never the same. When injury, stroke, or disease touch the brain, lives change profoundly. But some of these lives tell stories of quiet victories, of miracles, both great and small. And these tales also open a window to the remarkable capacities of the brain, its power to repair and restore itself a power we're just beginning to discover and understand. I'm David Suzuki, and we're about to witness one such story of devotion and human resiliency. pages long are one man's efforts to make sense of the stroke that changed his married life. Nine years ago, my wife collapsed with a stroke. Her heart stopped for a few minutes and she was almost brain dead. She was in a coma for two months. At the time, all children were growing and I had just retired from my job. We were looking forward to spending our retirement together. The stroke occurred just as we were beginning our new life. What I find mysterious about my wife's illness is that, after all these years, she has become almost a daughter to me, a child who is still growing. How much will she recover? What am I supposed to do? Here, in Hanamaki, husband and wife spend their days at the city hospital. For Kentaro Sasaki and his wife Toshko, their shattered lives called on new measures of courage and forbearance. At the time of her stroke, Toshko's doctors thought she was on the verge of brain death. Her recovery has been painstakingly slow. But today, another triumph. Toshko is learning to count again.
<laughs> Throughout the years since Toshko's illness, her husband has been at her side. It is he who now attends to her daily needs, preparing meals and helping to feed and bathe her. Toshko cannot walk. The stroke damaged a certain area of her brain that left her right side paralyzed. Even the simplest tasks are now exhausting. Though it's the king of the nervous system, the human brain is also extremely delicate. To work properly, it requires lots of blood, more than any other part of the body. An intricate network of blood vessels carries oxygen and other essential nutrients to the brain. During a stroke, these lifelines are cut. When blood flow stops, it takes only a few minutes for critical nerve cells or neurons to die. Unlike other cells in the body, neurons don't regenerate. Once they die, they're gone forever. This is an MRI scan of Toshko's injured brain. Most of the left side was destroyed when the blood vessels that fed that area were blocked. New imaging techniques provide a three-dimensional view and show in vivid detail the extent of damage. A stroke does more than destroy tissue. It shuts down large areas of the brain's communications networks. These networks consist of neurons that exchange information using bursts of electricity. When a blood clot destroys a neuron, it also cuts off the neuron's ability to talk to other cells. If the information lines are severed, we may lose the ability to perform important functions such as talking or walking. But the brain, as it turns out, is still resilient. Even in the face of catastrophic injury, healthy neurons can take over some of the responsibilities of damaged or dead cells. When an injured brain starts to build new networks of neurons, the process of recovery begins. To understand how the brain recovers, we need to study the behavior of its nerve cells. The brain houses roughly 100 billion nerve cells, and they reach out and connect with each other with their long, wiry fibers. By themselves, brain cells aren't too impressive. But when they hook up with each other, they become truly astonishing. Here, actual cells or neurons are building a circuit. One by one, neurons form connections with each other creating vast chains of communication networks. The phenomenal quantity of connections, astounding in their intricacy and complexity, eventually number in the trillions. It's the 
these connections that allow neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication, the basis of all brain activity. Neurons talk to each other in a two-step process, using electricity and chemistry. Electrical signals, traveling through each cell, send bursts of chemical molecules from one neuron to the next. These chemicals, called neurotransmitters, convey countless kinds of messages. The brain's neural networks extend through the rest of the nervous system in the body. This allows the body to feed the brain a constant stream of information about the surrounding environment. What the body picks up on its right side enters the left side of the brain. The left brain also controls movement of the right side. Conversely, the right side of the brain controls movement on the left side of the body. Other sections of the brain are also delegated to certain tasks. This area covers vision. This strip handles touch. This one, movement. Speech comes from the areas shown in yellow and orange. Only the left side of the brain is equipped with the neural networks for language. If a stroke damages the left side of the brain, the patient may lose the ability to speak. A stroke like this could also paralyze the right side of the body. This is what happened to Kentaro's wife. Kentaro has been charting his wife's progress for nearly a decade now. Most stroke victims regain whatever functions their brains can restore within a year or two. But now, doctors realize that the brain can slowly improve for years afterward. Its neurons continuously rewire and remodel their networks based on what the brain encounters in the outside world. Consequently, the more stimulation the brain receives, the faster it can rewire itself. Doctors credit much of Toshko's improvement to the persistent attentions of her husband, who provides her with constant sensations. Still, Toshko's recovery is slow, due in part to her age. 69. When we are younger, our brains are much more resilient. They can adapt and respond to incoming information from the environment with lightning speed. This special kindergarten in Osaka, Japan, shows the remarkable recovery rates for brain-damaged children. About a third of the youngsters here suffer neurological problems. The emphasis is placed on physical stimulation, finding ways to encourage the brain to interact as much as possible with the outside environment to stimulate its neural networks. The results are sometimes astonishing. This young boy, Shunchan, was born with such severe brain damage Doctors did not expect him to live.
This is an MRI image of Shun's brain. The only parts of his brain that function are highlighted in yellow. The dark cavity shows the extent of the damage. Areas normally dedicated to sight, hearing and movement are missing. Even so, Shun can walk, see and hear. The healthy parts of his brain, those neural networks that still function normally, have taken over those tasks. Dr. Kogure is a neurologist who specializes in brain restoration. He's been observing this process in the children at the kindergarten. This is a child no one expected would ever be able to see. If he had been seen by 50 doctors, all would probably have said he'd be bedridden and unable to see or hear. But the fact is, he can do these things. The part of his brain that was left intact has compensated to the extent that we now expect him to be able to be relatively independent in all sorts of daily life skills. The reason for Shun Chan's miraculous recovery may lie here, in the oldest part of the brain, called the brainstem. Functioning like a main switch, the brainstem maintains all brain activity. Its axons spread throughout the entire brain. Excitation of the brainstem results in the transmission of electrical impulses which heighten brain activity. Therapists believe that repetitive exercises like crawling might stimulate the brainstem, thus improving the brain's recovery from trauma. Even before Shun entered this kindergarten, he had made remarkable progress, thanks to the efforts of his mother, who nurtured him constantly. When he was born, Shun was stiff and non-responsive. He didn't even cry. Soon after Shun's birth, his mother massaged him every day, all over his body for long periods, calling his name. She shook his hands, encouraged him to touch objects that were hot or cold, exposed him to different colors and smells of flowers and foods. When Shun started to smile, his mother returned him and spoke to him. The constant care paid off, and when Shun was able to move on his own, his mother took him to this kindergarten. Shun continues to progress, a remarkable testament to the resiliency of the young brain. How is it that a child's brain recovers faster than an adult's? Part of the answer lies with the fact that a child's brain is much more elastic. This microscopic footage shows young neurons on the left and older ones on the right. Both of the neural branches are cut at the same time. Notice the speed with which the young ones reconnect on the left side. The young brain's ability to rewire itself quickly plays a key role in rehabilitation. Across the world, there are similar success stories of brain restoration among the young. One comes from Georgia. Throughout his young life, 10-year-old Jonathan Wilbanks suffered from severe epilepsy. Doctors tried to treat it without success. Three years ago, as a last resort, surgeons removed the left half of Jonathan's brain to stop the life-threatening seizures.
This MRI image shows how much of Jonathan's brain was actually taken out. After surgery, Jonathan could no longer speak. With his left brain missing, Jonathan couldn't move the right half of his body. This is Jonathan today. Three years have passed since the operation. Much of his paralysis is gone. He can even grip with his right hand. Looking at this energetic 13-year-old in action, it's hard to imagine that the left half of his brain is missing. right leg is fully functional, capable even of a few swift kicks. Though Jonathan still struggles with speech, the words are getting easier. Oh, yeah. The apple is red. Okay. He still has difficulty, for example, grouping nouns into their proper categories. Is it? It will take hard work, but Jonathan's prospects for a full recovery are extremely good. Here is a computer-enhanced brain image of a 35-year-old man who, as a boy, underwent the same surgery as Jonathan. He now lives a normal life. A PET scan of the brain, shown in colors, reveals that this patient's speech ability, normally handled by the brain's left side, has migrated to the right side, where it's handled by other neural networks. suffers injury, a number of biological events unfold that allow the organ to begin repairing itself. This is a microscopic picture of damaged brain tissue. The holes are created by special cleanup cells that clear away the debris of dead tissue. This process is carried out by macrophages, shown in blue and astrocytes highlighted in orange. Together, these cells pave the way for restoration. Here's what happens inside the brain. These are normal neurons with electric impulses traveling through them. After suffering damage, the blue neurons on the right are destroyed. The impulses are no longer transmitted. The first to arrive on the scene are the macrophages, who consume the damaged tissue. When they finish clearing away the debris, they signal the astrocytes. The astrocytes 
help the cleanup by releasing vast amounts of a substance called nerve growth factor. Working like a biological fertilizer, nerve growth factor encourages neurons to sprout new branches that reach out and connect with other neurons. New lines of communication are set up to do what the damaged neurons once did. With the power lines restored, the brain regains some of its functions. Under the microscope, it's possible to see these housekeeping cells at work. These are actual macrophages, the brain's Pac-Man. When the brain is damaged, macrophages increase in number and appetite. After the cells consume the damaged tissue, fluid collects in the empty spaces left behind. The neurons can then extend their branches into these spaces to rebuild networks. They're encouraged by these astrocytes, which, upon bursting, release nerve growth factor. Under microscope, it's possible to see nerve growth factors' dramatic effects. The substance was added to the neurons on the right. Axons are growing rapidly. Restoration of brain function begins with this new growth. Some researchers speculate that nerve growth factor helps account for the flexible wiring in the brain. A site like this, neurons sprouting fibers and establishing new connections, dismantles our previous notions about the brain's static and hardwired character. Still, when the brain suffers injury, full restoration of functions depends on more than a neuron's ability to grow new connections. Research shows that sometimes when the brain is rebuilding its damaged networks, the neural wires get crossed by mistake. At this hospital in Germany, a patient is recovering from a stroke that damaged the left side of her brain, leaving her right side paralyzed. Therapy helped her regain some movement. Viel besser. Die Sprache ist auch schon wesentlich besser geworden. Still, when she moves her right hand, notice that her left hand moves too. The neural wires that control movement in her right and left hands have crossed. Vierter Finger und dritter und aufmachen und zwei und drei und vier. The brain can correct this too by reinforcing and strengthening newly restored circuits. To see how, we need an inside view of how neural forests grow. Here, newly formed branches of neurons reach out and connect with this neuron in an attempt to restore certain functions. Before the injury, only one particular neuron fired off its signal to this one. But in this newly formed network, the cell is getting messages from many others. No clear pathway or circuit has been set up. Consequently, the information is muddled and weak. The connecting neurons bombard the receiving neuron with neurotransmitters, chemical molecules that carry a variety of messages. What we have, understandably, is a confused network. 
The incoming red signals are the correct ones. Physical therapy can reinforce that particular circuit and give the network a much needed jolt to straighten itself. Now, the receiving neuron is starting to get a stronger, clearer signal from the red circuit, while other neurons continue to send their weak signals in blue. Eventually, the red circuit replaces the other connections, and the network undergoes a bit of neural pruning. The weak connections are weeded out as the strong one grows more firmly rooted. Through the constant reinforcement that physical therapy provides, the circuit is finally restored to its proper working order. <laughs> For Toshko, her long journey toward recovery began just a few months after her stroke, when she started to feel pain on the right side of her body. The neural networks that allow her to experience sensation were slowly reconstructed. Now, she is trying to gain movement of her right side. Days like this remind Kentaro why he is here. But sometimes, progress is frustratingly slow. Kentaro has devoted several years to trying to teach his wife to speak again. Her increasingly frequent bouts of resistance began to puzzle him. In his diaries, Kentaro expressed the feeling that Toshiko had entered a rebellious stage, that she was simply acting up the way an adolescent might. But Toshiko's refusal to cooperate intensified as time passed. Finally, Kentaro sought out someone who could explain his wife's behavior. Kentaro arranged a visit between his wife and Dr. Kogura, the same doctor who studies neurological restoration in children at the kindergarten in Osaka. Can you see this? What about this? How about over here? And how about over here? Now you can see. Are you feeling okay? How are you feeling? Toshiko is decidedly more cooperative with the doctor.
今日は気分はいかがですか She seems to save her frustration only for her husband. Later, Dr. Kogura advises Kentaro. I really admire the way you've devoted yourself to caring for your wife. But I think I know what's bothering her at the moment. From what I've observed, Toshiko uses a full range of facial expressions to show happiness, sadness, and anger. It would be a mistake to think of her as a child or adolescent. All of our experiences are stored as memories in various parts of the brain. Toshiko has lost certain parts of her memory, but she still has recollections dating back 40, even 60 years, so she's certainly not a child. The various sounds and movements she makes, they are words themselves. It's the way she can make herself understood using her right brain. If you make a new start with this in mind, she's certain to improve. Dr. Kogura advises Kentaro that his wife's so called rebellion may be a healthy attempt to express herself. When Toshiko's stroke destroyed the left side of her brain, it also destroyed her speech center and her ability to communicate. Toshko was becoming more and more frustrated with Kentaro. Because he was trying to teach her things that require use of the left brain. Dr. Kogure encouraged Kentaro instead to appeal to her right brain through skills like singing. Toshiko's gestures and facial expressions while singing are her right brain's way of communicating. <laughs> Toshko's healthy right brain has tried to compensate for the left as best it can. In this PET scan image, the white, yellow, and red colors indicate high levels of brain activity. Whereas in a normal brain, the right side is not taxed to quite the same extent. Instead of using words, Toshko uses different sounds to convey her thoughts. This is the vocabulary of the right brain. In healthy brains, the right and left sides work together to integrate words with proper intonations. The left brain produces the correct speech, and the right brain mediates the emotions attached to it. Hi, how are you? Words produced only with the left brain will be intelligible but will sound flat or indifferent. Hi, how are you? Conversely, if only the right brain is involved, then the language will sound like gibberish, although the emotions accompanying them might be recognizable. Wow, what? Even though the sounds produced by the right brain aren't normal speech, 
they are filled with intent. The TTT sound that Toshko makes means something. Kentaro needs to figure out what. In this case, she wants a potato chip. Body movements and hand gestures are also important elements of right brain communication. These gestures and their accompanying sounds allowed Toshko to develop her own vocabulary. She uses about 30 signals, and each has a specific purpose. She is also successful at expressing a wide range of feelings. Not all days are productive, though. Some days, the more Kentaro tries to engage his wife, the more she resists. Willpower wields tremendous influence over our ability to heal ourselves though doctors are unsure how or why it works. Now, researchers think the answer might lie in the brainstem. The brainstem is our life support system. It controls heart rate and breathing. But within the brainstem sits a pea-sized area called the locus ceruleus. The locus ceruleus consists of a tight bundle of neurons. About 30,000 of them cluster in this tiny space. The influence of those neurons extends throughout the brain as their long fibers build looping pathways of communication. These neural streams interact with the areas of the brain that control motivation and attention. And when excited, the neurons of the locus ceruleus use their extended fibers to pump a chemical substance called noradrenaline into the neural system. The noradrenaline prompts the yellow astrocyte to release nerve growth factor and other similar chemicals that encourage regeneration. We can see noradrenaline's dramatic effects using this experiment. This rat is missing areas of his right brain. As a result, the left side of his body is paralyzed. The rat is unable to cross the wooden walkway. It then receives an injection of a drug that stimulates the release of noradrenaline. Three hours later, the paralysis disappears.
Under a microscope, we can see noradrenaline strengthening neural activity. Here are neurons in a cat that normally respond to vision. When noradrenaline is added, the number of responding neurons rises dramatically. The results suggest that neural networks are somehow fortified or extended by noradrenaline. A picture of willpower and its effects on recovery might then look something like this. A stimulated brainstem that channels streams of noradrenaline throughout the brain, activating the cells responsible for restoration. A patient's environment can deeply affect motivation. Victims of traumatic brain injury often show a powerful need to return to their familiar world, to regain pieces of a lost past. In his diaries, Kentaro wrote of revisiting favorite places with his wife. Today will be a simple outing to the supermarket. But to his wife, Kentaro recalls shopping was always great fun. This is the store where Toshiko shopped before her stroke. Traveling the aisles and scanning the items on display, Toshiko appears remarkably attentive and stimulated. はい。はい、これ持って。はい、こんな感じに入れていくんだ。ね。で、みんなこれをいっぱい全部持つの、これ。はい、だろう。こっちの釣り。どれ?こっちの持つよ。いっぱい溜まったな。うん。Is a normalizing activity. One that anchors her more firmly to the life she once had. The experience seems to leave a strong impression on her. As Toshiko's story illustrates, the brain can continue to recover from traumatic injury for as long as 10 years. Each case is different depending on motivation, therapy and normalizing activities. But the miracles that we hope for are still decades away. When they arrive, they may look like this. Researchers in Chicago are working on a brain coolant that could be injected into the carotid artery minutes after someone suffers a stroke or traumatic head injury. Starved for oxygen and blood, neurons only survive for about two minutes or less. When the neurons die, the damage is done. But clinical trials have proven that cooling the brain enables the cells to live for an hour or more. Scientists are also developing a brain cooling helmet. In the hands of paramedics, this kind of equipment could someday buy victims of brain injury the crucial time they need for treatment and make the difference between tragedy and triumph. Until that time, patients like Toshko must depend on the rehabilitation process, where success comes slower but is perhaps more poignant. The fall 
festival in Hanamaki, a time to pray for a bountiful harvest. This place harbors rich memories for both Toshko and Kintaro. In the old days, they attended the festival almost every year. In the tradition of their ancestors, the dancers celebrate a season of plenty, opening the way to a new cycle of growth. For Toshko, these familiar rhythms are becoming increasingly resonant as old feelings stir inside her and she discovers new ways to share them. A recent entry in Kentaro's diary reads, I have been trying my best to teach my wife, but I'm beginning to question now, who is the student and who is the teacher? It's not always so clear anymore. For Toshko and Kintaro, a new cycle of restoration and life is just beginning. the next episode of The Brain, Our Universe Within, an artist deliberately opens the doors of perception inside his own brain. Across the globe, Japanese pilgrims do the same. How does brain chemistry create personality, affect behavior, mood, and temperament? What do drugs like Prozac do inside our heads? As we decode the brain, do we begin to decode human identity? Join me, David Suzuki, for the next episode of The Brain, Our Universe Within.